Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to CX Network's first event of 2023, which is Predictive CX. We're kicking off today with a fireside chat between our Editor-in-Chief, Mel Mingus, and the Head of Data Analytics and AI at McDonald's, Tav Najjar. Um, please do stick around for the sessions afterwards. We've got a really good program in store. Um, and just two things to be aware of before I hand straight over to Mel and Tav. Um, the first thing to note is that there is a survey at the end of the session. Please do go ahead and fill that out if you can. It'll only take a couple of minutes. Um, and secondly, this uh, session is being recorded and it will be available on demand uh, if you wanted to revisit any talking points after we're done. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand straight over to Mel. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so just a quick one today before we dive straight into the conversation with Tav. Um, for those who are watching this session live, you do have the chance to put your own questions um, to our speaker for this session. Um, if you do want to do that, you can see a Q&A box on your screen and we will address all the audience Q&As that we can at the end of the session. Um, but without any further ado, and today we are talking about how McDonald's uses data to gain a 360 degree view of its customer and build a seamless journey for that customer customer. Um, Tav, you are the Global Director, uh, Senior Director, sorry, of CX Transformation for Data and Analytics. So let's set the scene today by hearing a little bit about your role at McDonald's and the projects you've been driving recently. Yeah, thanks, Mel, and thanks everybody at the CX Network for, uh, for having me here today. It's great to be here and to be able to actually kick off this amazing event that you guys have got planned. So um, I've been at McDonald's just over a year, and, you know, obviously it's been a uh, a great uh, time to join McDonald's, uh, an amazing brand, and essentially, you know, 40,000 restaurants globally across 120 countries. 90% um, of the population in those countries visit McDonald's at least twice, um, you know, per year. So that's massive penetration from a brand point of view. Um, and, you know, there's 2.2 million people that work across uh, the business itself. So this, the sheer size and scale behind one brand is just phenomenal. Um, so I um, I came in, as I mentioned, just over a year ago, and I've got the uh, the pleasure of leading an amazing team. And um, we look after everything essentially from an analytics and reporting point of view, from thinking about running the business, that's, you know, uh, information around on what's happened, uh, transforming the business, and that's thinking about some of our, uh, um, you know, areas such as digital and, uh, and uh, drive-through uh, and uh, delivery as well, and then, of course, grow the business, and that's looking at uh, understanding ways that we can bring in incremental growth uh, for McDonald's uh, across the globe as well. Excellent. That's quite um, a wide remit. Well, as most people who are in this session already know, data is at the heart of customer personalization um, and predictive CX. Um, and it also obviously contributes to that seamless friction-free journey. Um, so on that note, what data does McDonald's gather on its customers and from where is that data sourced? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, a really direct question. I just want to take a step back and just give a holistic view first in terms of um, it's, it's essentially, you know, every single day there's data that is being processed through um, transactions. So there's transaction data within the restaurants, but we're obviously nine, there's a three-legged stool, which, which is how we talk about it at McDonald's, that the corporate you know, uh, part, where, which is where I work, obviously our su suppliers who supply the, the amazing ingredients and food for, for us to be able to serve restaurants, uh, serve customers in our restaurants, and of course the franchisees, and that's a really important part, you know, obviously making the, the system work for the customers. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have customer data on every single transaction. Mm -hmm. Our customer data, you've got to have consent to be able to understand, Mel, in certain sense of, you know, how often you visit mcdonald's and, and what you're what you like um actually um purchasing from mcdonald's either for yourself or for your family so i think there's been a great uh, journey on understanding our customers at an individual level um over the last uh, few years as we've launched uh, quite late actually in the sense of looking versus other qsrs uh, our loyalty programs, but also the massive in terms of now one of the biggest globally, um, just because of the actual affinity people have with the with the brand um, to be able to actually know customers so that we can um, create, you know, relevant and personalized and frictionless experience 
uh, experiences for all our customers. So really, really, you know, important for me, I one thing I've seen coming in a year ago, um, whereas I've obviously looked at externally what some of the companies do and how they can actually be really smart in trying to understand buying and purchasing habits. I'm sure you've been there where you've, you know, you've been talking about something and then you get pushed an advert thinking, looking around, is some, somebody listening or, or spying on me? But um, um, there's a massive, huge layer of responsibility linked to the brand across the whole of McDonald's. So they won't do anything that isn't actually, uh, you know, a layer even above what, uh, what we can do with data legally, which means that consent is, up, you know, for, first and foremost across everything in capturing customer data. That's really interesting. Um, okay, well, um, kind of looking at the customer journey now, um, we all know that memorable and seamless experiences are what customers want. Um, what does a memorable and seamless experience look like for McDonald's? Um, and how does the information that you're extracting support you in delivering that experience? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if we think about McDonald's starting 68 years ago, um, you know, the front door of the restaurant was the actual front door of the restaurant. But the world that we live in today, you know, 68 years on, the front door of the restaurant can actually be your thumb on a mobile phone. So it's looking at all the different types of customer journeys that, ex that exist. And that might be the traditional going into the restaurant and obviously up to the front counter. That might be going into the restaurant and actually visiting one of our kiosks and placing your order on the kiosk. And that can also be done link to your loyalty so that actually you can then link whatever it is you're buying to your to your loyalty account and then redeem any points or gain and, and be rewarded with any points so there's two two areas of how you can actually make a mcdonald's purchase there and then of course there's the drive-through uh, which which came a little bit, little bit later after we we launched as a business but obviously one of one of the largest um, and most convenient ways to, to purchase McDonald's. Um, and then of course, the mobile application itself being another way that you can actually purchase um, McDonald's and, and have your order fulfilled. And then, um, you know, more recently delivery, which has massively just, uh, just gone up and been um, something that I think, you know, five years ago, wasn't the norm for big, larger, you know, brands to be able to be uh, QSR brands to be able to be delivering, um, um, directly to to consumers and to, to customers but that's obviously changed massively in the last few years so around that that's a very different experience if you think about the, that yourself as a as a mcdonald's customer uh, and then in each of those there's something that we, we call our moments of truth so we want to understand before we actually think about the uh, the customer experience to your point of seamless and memorable what are the moments of truth so it's about now, when you you know when you're thinking about going to to McDonald's and, and kind of how can we can we um, help you when you're thinking about going to McDonald's is the first moment of truth, and the next one is when you're actually then ordering at McDonald's in all those areas that in the ways I talked about you know how can we how can we deliver that seamless and memorable when you're actually ordering uh, a McDonald's and then the next one is obviously when you're paying and waiting for your McDonald's and how can we make it seamless and memorable when you're when you're paying and waiting for your for your McDonald's and making sure that you are you know obviously um have the, the right engagement at that stage then of course there's you know you're, you're when you're collecting and receiving your McDonald's uh, how can we make sure that's also seamless and memorable and five you know not forgetting when you're consuming your McDonald's how can we make sure that the actual experience is seamless uh, and memorable. So what I've just talked about there is the customer journeys, and obviously, hopefully, it will resonate with the people um, that have been that are, that are joining us today and that have been to McDonald's that they've actually gone through um, each of those um, at some point, um, hopefully um, more more frequently. And then, then in addition to that, thinking about okay, there's five different ways that we can think about helping to deliver a a, a seamless and memorable customer experience uh, and also then you know on top of that we uh, we also think about the uh, it doesn't matter what we do as a business I mean that's important but we've got to also think about the the last point or the last mile of, of your interaction essentially in a restaurant is with our crew one of the most important you know we call our crew the restaurant team so we also make sure that we we understand their experience as well so the crew or the restaurant experience, team experience is essentially the, the customer experience. So we focus on both, not just not just one, to make sure we can make it seamless uh, and memorable a bit, uh, against both those things. So I've talked about 
the customer journeys as a kind of the highest level. And then I've talked about the five moments of truth and I've kind of linked that to say, well, it's not just about the customer journey, which is really, really important in the experience there, but also the restaurant team experience because they are obviously strongly correlated. And then finally, there's this piece where, I don't know if you know this, but today the traditional way that we actually capture feedback on a customer experience is, you know, when you've got your, your receipt or you, you, know, you, you, you come away and you've had your uh, McDonald's experiences, there's actually a URL on there where you can actually go and complete a survey uh, and actually give feedback about your McDonald's experience, whether it be on each of those customer journeys that I talked about at the top or any of those moments of truth that I've talked about, or whether it be, you know, for, for yourself as a customer or whether it be with any interaction uh, from any of the restaurant teams and crew. Um, that's great and it's worked and it's working and it's, I think it's rolled out across the majority of our, you know, 100 plus markets. But at the same time, it's after the experience has taken place, Mel. So what we're actually doing, when you start thinking about predictive CX, it's about how can we think about ways to um, prevent a, an experience to happen that isn't seamless and memorable, or if something happens um, during a customer experience, how can we make it right and ensure that we we uh, we are able to actually you know say that we this wasn't the the level that we wanted the experience to be to you as a customer today, but we recognise that and we're making it making it right. So those are the two areas of, of focus. And then finally, I've talked about you know to your earlier question about um, how many customers, or how do we capture three hundred and sixty you know a uh, degree uh, data on our customers. I think we're in about fifty of our markets now from a loyalty point of view. So massive kind of you know speed in the sense of rolling out um our loyalty programs and you know some of them are more mature and you have a lot of um the population obviously using those and in those markets you actually see the uh the uh use of the app much higher versus some other markets where actually loyalty program is really really new i'm in the uk right now and the uk i think it's only been four months since the loyalty program has has been launched but growing rapidly but the thing is maybe mobile the app isn't isn't as, as highly used as as um, maybe the kiosk or maybe delivery which obviously shot through the roof during the pandemic so it's thinking about the right level of experience at those layers that i talked about on a market by market basis as well to be able to provide a, a consistent level of a seamless and memorable experience to customers um, there's a lot of sources of information that you cited there. Um, how do you actually, um, do you at all actually, um, kind of join up what's happening between those different sources, whether it's, you know, the receipts, survey data and the app data, for example, do, is there a call to cross-reference your findings on those platforms? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're actually, um, there's so many great siloed, you know, initiatives that happen across any company, even where I, you know, where I came from, you see, great teams doing great things based at a you see you see it not only happening horizontally but vertically as well you see it happening uh, at a global level at a, at a segment or regional level and then at, at a market level and then within, within each of those layers you see it happening across you know sales marketing supply chain finance so what we're actually trying to do is to create go on this journey to create a a one mcdonald's way and that doesn't you know it's not overnight you're not going to turn a switch if you think about the size and scale but it's about focusing on the right area so we're doing that using a human-centric design approach and looking at what is the problem that we're trying to solve focusing on actually identifying what that problem is that we're trying to solve engaging with those stakeholders whether it be customers whether it be restaurant team whether it be actually franchisees or whether it be our own internal teams and understanding what's important to them prioritizing all that using a desirable desirability viability and feasibility approach and that gives us a good prioritization order in being able to understand where do we start if you want to bring all these different siloed ways of working into one area and call it one source of truth Okay, um, so we have, um, well, you have um, spoken about the McDonald's loyalty program in reference to what's been happening. Um, but if we focus on that now and um, for the next question, obviously, there's a huge amount of customer information um, in these programs. And yours is actually one of the largest in the world. Um, what does the rewards program play? Well, sorry, what role does the rewards program play in your data strategy at present? 
Yeah, so I think we're on a journey of our, of our data strategy, to be completely honest with you. At the same time, we have to make sure that we have the right governance and guardrails in place. That's first and foremost. So there's um, a lot of there's a lot of companies that that maybe do um, more than they than they can or should, or maybe they sit on the uh, on the actual fence when it comes to how can they actually use the the customer data that they collect and actually how they can actually then use that data. But as I said earlier on, there's a massive thing first and foremost, before it comes into the strategy of how we're then gonna use that, it's a sense of what do our customers actually want? What are our customers actually giving us consent to be able to do? And essentially it's about rewarding them and going back to very simply giving a seamless and memorable experience to, to all customers and making sure that we do that First and foremost, with our, with our, um, you know, with our brand uh, and all of our, um, uh, either our purpose of feeding and fostering communities, or our values of, you know, community, serve, integrity, family, um, and yeah, the, the fifth one, but it's gone my, from my brain. But that's first and foremost before we do anything um, on on any of this stuff. Okay, um, so if we look at the kind of things that can be predicted um, and the things that maybe you've done in the past, some real life case studies, um, how, how are you using this data in real life? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think the, the world that we live in today, there's a lot you can do with data, not customer data, but all types of data. So actually the mindset is around um and it was really good. I mean, in my, in my last role before I joined McDonald's, I used to lead um, AI um, for a CPG, uh, uh, you know, uh, holistically. And we did some great things from predicting cancer in pets all the way through to creating a, uh, a hedging strategy for buying our, our commodities. So really did some awesome stuff using, you know, artificial intelligence. And obviously everybody knows the kind of the big boom of what else is going on right now and different use cases of how AI is being, being used. So there's a lot you can actually do. What I said a year ago was, um, you know, when I used to speak to somebody and, and meet people, they used to be like, oh, great, we've got an AI guy. We can do, we can do amazing forecasting. We can predict the future. And first and foremost, predicting the future is very difficult. Like Mark Twain, a famous author, said that years ago, and that hasn't changed. You can, you can be better at doing it, but it's still difficult to actually absolutely, you know, predict the future. Um, but to be able to predict the future, you've got to be able to understand the past much better than you've ever done before. And that's where building a good foundation of different data assets, and that's not just customer data, that's just one pillar of everything else you need to know, but building a good foundation of what's happened historically, not just internally, but externally, can actually allow you to think differently in the sense of one of the things that are important to customers is it quality of food is it speed of service is it just the engagement with with our employees and our crew uh, what is it that, that's actually most important to them and then what you can actually do is you can start to say okay well let's understand what's happened in the past where let's just take for example speed of service and understand in the past what happened where essentially male has been to McDonald's and maybe felt like the service that she experienced on that last visit to McDonald's wasn't as fast as she actually expects McDonald's to deliver. So with that, you know, you do a few things. You can actually look at what happened and that's using data and saying, well, OK, you know, it was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday evening. There was a sporting game on around the corner. It was raining. We had, you know, two less people working for whatever reason on on the actual drive. So you can start to build a big picture of what happened in that. And is that a one off or is that actually a, a trend of, you know, um, multiple um, uh, visits for, for customers? So you can then understand actually when. It is a Tuesday and when there is a sporting game and, and when it is raining and I'm obviously making this up just to kind of, you know, um, share the point, you can actually think about how can you prevent Mel from having uh, a, a perceived slow experience before a game, sorry. But the interesting thing is you can also then look at what Mel said in her feedback. And let's just say, for example, Mel gave feedback and said, I had a really slow experience on my last visit to mcdonald's mm -hmm. what you can actually do is look at that perception from mel 
and look at actually what happened. How fast were we versus how fast we normally are? Was there other things happening? Because then you can, you know, you've got to take the noise out as well. You've got to turn around and say, well, actually, you know, we weren't that slow. We were just how we normally are. There was nothing else out there that was impacting our speed. What was, then it's a perception piece, right? So then you kind of understand well, what's happening with Mel, where does, you know, understand more if we've got consent, then we can understand more about Mel and how from Mel visits and try and see if we can deliver a, a better experience. But it's really important to not just try and do predictive customer experience on just one data set. It's the internal, it's the external, and it's obviously um, everything that you, you, from a customer point of view, are or have the, the ability to or consent to, to see. But then being able to look at how you can, you know, prevent that in the future. But then layer alongside that the actual perception. So what Mel said. So there's the actual data and the metrics, and then there's the actual perception. You can see if there's any correlation across both. It's fascinating stuff. It sounds like it is, yeah. I really um, admire you for being able to just draw a line into that and move on to other tasks. If I was you, I think I'd just spend all the time looking at, oh, why, why is this person so impatient? Um, okay, just a quick note for those who are watching live. Um, do send in your own questions for Tav. We have uh, just over 10 minutes left on the clock, so do you type fast. Um, Tav, another question for you then. Um, do, we've obviously referenced employees before. You've mentioned that you obviously have more than 2 million of them. Um, does date, employee data come into this strategy and if so how is that used tell us a bit more yeah i think i touched on it and when i when i say employee data i think i'm talking about our restaurant team and crew mm -hmm. um so you know we we obviously do um, like many companies understand and, and ask about you know a uh, crew engagement and obviously interaction and understand from their point of view what's happening as well because i think it's only half the picture if you only ask the customer about their experience and you know um and, and obviously we're, we're a customer first where you know you start with the customer and the business will take care of itself as ray Kroc said in 1955 fred turner said in 1973 one of our ceos we're people first business let's not forget that to bring both of those quotes together actually means that we need to totally understand not just what's happening from the customer side but also understand what's happening from the from the crew and the employee side as well again doesn't take anything away from a guardrails or from a legal or from a from a consent point of view but we're actually just trying to take this information about the engagement and just to understand maybe what's happening in a in a restaurant to be able to understand how can we improve the engagement of our of our crew and team as well Um, so you are obviously an expert in your field when it comes to data analytics, um, but learning is a lifelong process, and particularly in this fast-moving field. Um, so what is the most um, surprising thing that you would say you have learned about how data can be used since you started at McDonald's? Yeah, so firstly, I, I'm, you know, not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm you know, learning every single day, and I'm, I, I love learning with my team and learning from my team as well and inspiring and being inspired and being able to grow every single day. Um, so that's, that's first and foremost, having that improved mindset to be able to be open to being surprised, which is your question, and obviously um, looking at things from a different point of view. Um, and then moving to your question, I think it's just, you know, the sheer size and scale of the brand is just phenomenal and it's great you know and um people used to joke to me about a year ago that you'll eventually have ketchup running through your veins and i think a year a year later and i feel like i feel like it is right because you just get so uh you know close to the, the brand and proud of the brand as well and some of the amazing things that you know that they uh, that they are doing and do and have done um so it's really around i think you know understanding how we be responsible but also how we be efficient to be able to create one mcdonald's way and that's i think where you're going to see that the the uh, the actual um benefits of being able to do something once but do it well i think even from a marketing campaign point of view i think previously we did a lot of I think probably still might maybe, maybe some of um you know brands um uh, or activation campaigns across different markets but now there's been there's been examples over the last couple of years of, of global campaigns which have been which have been amazing i think there was the uh the bts one um i think just before i joined and then this year there was the uh 
uh, one and gone McDonald's, which is essentially um, the, the the FIFA World Cup one. And then, you know, the fascinating um, one that, I don't know if you guys have seen around Raising Your Arches, which is the new one that just launched. It's just it's just amazing, right? Everything that's kind of relevant and, um, you know, personal and, and obviously frictionless right the way across the brand uh, and being able to have the opportunity to be, be part of that brand and make sure that we're doing the right things to take um, McDonald's into, into the next 60, 68 years. Fantastic. Okay, well then, um, final question from me. Um, when it comes to using data to develop a relationship with your customers, um, what are your key um, pieces of advice for our network members today? So when you say customers, you mean consumers or customers in terms of your internal teams or suppliers? Uh, B2C customers, yeah, so you consumers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, be very clear and transparent on what it is you're trying to do and why it is you're trying to do that and what it is that you're actually asking for. Um, and from my experience, there's so many companies out there that will, you know, that will reach out and say, hey, you know, we can do this for you and we can do that for you. And some of it's really smart because, you know, with the way technology technology is gone, there are some, some things that, that can be done that couldn't be done before with obviously the level of data available and the amount of, uh, you know, uh, how, how computation has gone down. But I'd say, you know, be responsible before anything else in whatever it is that you're doing because making or trying to do something that will make a level of incremental growth for your business is a very short-sighted and short-term point of view if down the line it comes out that you're doing something that you a don't have the consent to do and b you know isn't within within the uh, the guardrails of governance of what you're allowed to do so first and foremost be clear with your customers they'll they'll respect you for it be responsible and then um, put the strategy in place and then yeah go and go win Sound advice, Tav. Thank you for that. Um, we just have one more audience question before we are going to wrap up today. Um, probably not predictive CX related, but I'm going to put it to you anyway. How does McDonald's stand out amongst its competition? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really uh, good question. I think in most markets where we've got the majority um, share when it comes to QSR, um, I think there's always two or three players that are doing really good things uh, and might be taking, um, you know, sharing in some areas. I think we specifically, are, if you look at um, the core um, area of our accelerating the Archer strategy, we've got to focus on burger, chicken and, and coffee. So you can then link to that in case anyone's saying, well, who are? Because it's quite fascinating when I joined McDonald's, I was like, oh, that's a competitor. Oh, and that's a competitor as well. And, and it was quite funny. Someone said to me, don't walk into the office on day one with a, with a, with a coffee from another famous brand as such. And I never actually thought about it like that before. So um, that's, I, you know, I digress, but um, essentially that's the, comp the, com the competition landscape is very, very wide when you actually think about what, what McDonald's does. Um, but I think we're industry leaders um, across um, the majority of our markets, um, if not all. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great, but you know, that doesn't mean you, you can't, you can't just um, take that for granted. You've got to be able to stay, relevant and continue to grow and continue to to be where where the customer wants you to be and continue to deliver those seamless and memorable experiences that we talked about right at the start fantastic thanks Tav. well that brings us to the end of our 30 minute session um any closing thoughts no not at all it's been great again thank you to the whole cx network for for having me privileged to be able to to join you guys and, and open up today and Mel, it's been a, it's been a great conversation and I wish you guys all the best for the rest of the day. And uh, and just uh, I'm sure everybody else that's uh, online right now is going to have an amazing uh, sessions with a great speaker lineup that you've got to come. Thank you, Chloe. Over to you. Thank you. That's definitely the plan, Tav. And thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a really great conversation between you and Mel. Um, you've both been amazing. Thank you. Um, so our next session starts in about one minute where we're going to be joined by Matt Parisi from our partners at Telium. They're going to be discussing how you can really harness the power of first party data. So please do join us for that. Um, and our session after that will start at 10 a.m. And that is a fireside chat between myself and Ruchika Singh from Spotify. She's going to be discussing uh, predictive data modeling, which is really interesting. 
Um, and then our final session of the day is between Inflow CX, and they're going to be discussing um, some of the challenges that you might come across in your contact centres and how you can approach them. So it's a great lineup today, um, and I hope to see you on the next sessions. Thanks, everyone.